Welcome to this Frontier Forum deep dive session on genomic pathogen surveillance. I'm Lee Baker, the editorial advisor at Frontiers in Science. First of all, just a quick word about the journal. This is our flagship multidisciplinary open access journal focused on transformational science for healthy lives on a healthy planet. We take invited peer reviewed lead articles and we publish them within a hub of multi audience content designed to build bridges between science, policy and the general public. Today's deep dive focuses on this lead article published in April. It was authored by Mark Strulens, Catherine Ludden, Guido Werner, Vitaly Sinchenko, Pika Jokolainen, and Margaret Ip, on behalf of two study groups from the European Society for Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, ESCMID, that's the study groups on public health microbiology and epidemiological markers. The article advocates for the global extension of real-time genomic surveillance of pathogens to better tackle existing and future infectious disease threats, including future pandemics and the rise in antimicrobial resistance, AMR. It learn learning from and building from the experience that was gained during the COVID-19 pandemic. It outlines progress in various applications in public health and clinical care, and highlights how new technologies, new sequencing technologies, uh, and AI are helping to drive progress in some parts of the world. It also outlines key challenges and recommendations, a framework, if you like, for the global deployment of genomic surveillance on a one health approach, recognizing the interrelationship between human health, animal health, and the health of ecosystems. That is requiring uh, actions across healthcare, public health, as well as agriculture and the environment sectors. This is the article hub. Uh, the article is published here. It's, it's at the head of the, the hub. We also have an editorial by Professor Marian Koopmans from Erasmus in the Netherlands, a viewpoint article from David Engelthaler of the Translational Genomics Research Institute in Arizona, and a policy outlook by Dr. Stephen Morse of IHRC in Atlanta and Sigan Pillai of the US Food and Drugs Administration. In addition, as always uh, in our articles, there's a lay explainer with infographics and video, and there will soon be a, uh, an article in our Journal for Kids, Frontiers for Young Minds. So today you're going to hear from many of the participants in this article hub, and you'll have a chance to pose your own questions to them. Here is the agenda. First of all, we'll hear from several of the authors of the article. Professor Mark Strulens from the University Libre de Bruxelles will start off to, to set the scene for the day's discussion, introducing pathogen genomic surveillance. Professor Guido Werner from Robert Koch Institute in Germany will then take up technical advances in whole genome sequencing for the purposes of public health. Professor Vitaly Sinchenko from University of Sydney in Australia will talk about integrative solutions for genomic surveillance data sharing and analysis. And finally, Professor Margaret Ip from the Chinese University of Hong Kong will talk about One Health collaborations for epidemic preparedness. After that, we're going to have a panel discussion, including a Q&A from questions uh, from out there. That will include Dr. Stephen Morse from IHRC uh, in the USA and our guest also jo Dr. Josefina Campos from the World Health Organization. So first up is Mark Strulens. Mark has had a, a long and distinguished career. He's Professor Emeritus in Medical Microbiology at the University Libre in Brussels, Belgium. For many years, Mark's work has fostered, on, fostered uh, common approaches uh, to an interdisciplinary collaborations to bring genomic epidemiology and surveillance systems into public health microbiology. He's the chief, he was the chief microbiologist, as I'm sure many of you know, at the European Centers for Disease Control. Uh, Disease Prevention and Control, the ECDC. He's a former president of ESCMID and is currently the chair of the ESCMID study group on public health microbiology. He's also a section chief editor for two Frontiers journals, Frontiers in Medicine and Frontiers in Public Health. So Mark, thank you for very much for bringing this, uh, this critical topic uh, to Frontiers in Science uh, and over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lee, and thank you to Frontiers to my co-authors and colleagues from the ESCMIT study groups, and to all of you who have joined us today to explore together the way forward to 
leveraging pathogen genomic surveillance for enhanced prevention of infectious disease and uh, prepare better for the next pandemic. Genomic epidemiology has, over the past decade, brought in the era of evolutionary public health. Indeed, human beings are hosting microorganisms and including pathogens, and of course, evolve with them by mutual adaptation for eons and continue to do so as I speak. When this equilibrium becomes disrupted, infectious disease can arise. And when we treat those infections with antimicrobial agents, we select for drug resistance. And to actually understand these complex dynamics, we need the meta-discipline of genomic epidemiology. This is a project that combines information, but also inference principle from two sides of evidence that are connected. On the one hand, the whole genome sequence information on pathogen dynamics, population biology, and evolutionary process. And on the other hand, data about disease caused by this pathogen as they are distributed over time, place, and person regarding host susceptibility as well as exposure to these pathogen sources. For our Frontiers in Science paper, we gathered insights from the literature and from the experience of uh, colleagues with practice across the fields of academic research in microbiology and healthcare and public health. And we found that indeed genomic surveillance can help control infectious disease and mitigate antimicrobial resistance as the combination of whole genome sequencing of pathogens with epidemiological data from investigation and surveillance will and has been instrumental in earlier detection of outbreaks, small and large, in tracking the spread of epidemic pathogen, and importantly, monitor in near real time, increasingly so, the evolution of those pathogens and interaction with their host that modify the ability to transmit, to evade immunity or resist treatment. And these inference has really been essential to target and adapt our prevention and therapeutic strategies. So there's plenty of evidence beyond the COVID-19 management experience or the integration of whole genome sequencing with ethical information into public health surveillance and control strategies. As a first example of the power of this approach for epidemic detection and tracing, I'd like to revisit a case study of tracking multidrug resistant Klebsiella pneumonia. Indeed, Genomic surveillance has been instrumental in tracking Klebsiella epidemic clones worldwide over the past decade or so. And a few years back, we at ECDC were in the uh, possibility to facilitate the collaboration among European countries following an alert by Germany about an outbreak caused by a strain of Klebsiella pneumonia with an unusual novel phenotype. Double resistance by production of two beta lactamase and the M1 OXA48. This high level carbapenem, carbapenem resistant Klebsiella have indeed been found to be associated with increased risk of treatment failure and excess mortality, as well as great epidemic potential in the healthcare setting. And the complicated multi color graph to your right show you the results of the combined analysis of whole genome sequence data and epidemiological surveillance data from national surveillance across European countries. And to the left, you see that Germany and a few and other countries at this strain of Klebsiella with this particular multidrug resistance profile, but indicate by different color, not a single clonal lineage, but actually 10 different clonal lineage. More remarkable to the right, 
the happy data showed countries who were the uh, patients detected in Europe with this Klebsiella phenotype had been traveling to in the previous six months, or some of them been hospitalized. And you can see that some of them as a risk factor has been traveling within the same country or hospitalized elsewhere, and where the strain was detected, whereas others have been traveling outside Europe in countries such as in North Africa, for instance. And indeed, the dispersed uh, different strains could be traced back to a single country of origin, as indicated by each color code for these clips. So from that experience, it became clear that these dispersed cross-border outbreaks cannot be detected by local or national surveillance, but need collaborative international surveillance. This is being brought forward in performing ongoing uh, epidemic intelligence and collaborative analysis to monitor emerging multidrug resistant organisms in Europe to inform infection control policies. Second, perhaps even more challenging uh, illustration of the power of pathogen genomics is to do to surveillance, monitoring, and if I dare say, uh, contribute to this prediction, which obviously in biology is a very long shot. But let's consider how whole genome sequencing has become a routine tool for risk assessment of the ongoing uh, event of zoonotic influenza. And the next slide is from a very recent case report from uh, Texas, where a local public health and animal health investigators report on the first case, and there have been a few more since then, of human infection with highly pathogenic avian influenza AH5 and 1, in this case, in a dairy farm worker. As you know, there's been an episodic among cows in dairy farms in, in the continental US. And uh, the investigation, first of all, showed that the case was probably mild with uh, conjunctivitis that responded to antiviral therapy, and that the virus involved that were uh, sequenced both from the cattle that was sick and from the worker who came sick, did not pose uh, more than a low risk to public health. And why that? There were no secondary cases among the contacts of this farmer who received prophylaxis. And furthermore, the sequence analysis as compared to the existing database showed there was a typical avian virus which opportunity lacked the changes in the amaglutinin change that would affect the receptor specificity and facilitate uh, transmission to and between humans, even though some adaptive change were noted associated with mammalian infection. In summary, these approach show how important it is to combine investigative epidemiology and real-time sequencing, provide a balanced risk assessment, and importantly in this case, to check the match with pre-pandemic candidate influenza vaccines that are in development and poise for potential deployment should they be produced and distributed in case of need. In our paper, we advocate that the repurposing of capacity and capabilities developed during the COVID-19 pandemic response should espouse a one health genomic surveillance approach across disease and antimicrobial resistant threats. And the key word uh, in our paper is to advocate for collaboration, collaboration, and collaboration across the One Health ecosystem dimension. That includes, of course, the healthcare, public health sector, agriculture, animal health sector, and environment health monitoring. This implies will be further discussed in more detail today for sectoral collaboration, cross-disciplinary, dialogue and interaction and mutual learning and cross-border coordination and communication, both from the local level, where outbreaks would first be tackled, to the national, to the regional, to the global level, the total agenda, which we try to indicate from an academic perspective and a practitioner perspective that can be further achieved. Indeed, in the next presentation, uh, my colleagues will further uh, discuss 
we forward to harness identified enablers of uh, expanding genomic surveillance, real-time genomic surveillance across disease in a global perspective, which of course require international collaboration, the very challenging issue of open data sharing for which technical solutions exist, but the political acceptance and, and, and decision to find the proper uh, governance remains very challenging. And indeed, there are also uh, technical challenges and methodological uh, challenges to be overcome in terms of sampling frames, bioinformatic tools, workforce training, that is very important, and the rapid process for sequence and, and metadata sharing. And all these efforts obviously come at a very timely uh, event of the adoption by the World Health Assembly a few days back on June 1st on the um, pandemic emergency definition in the international health regulation amendments that underline the need for timely and equitable access to health product and tools to prepare and respond to future pandemic emergencies that obviously would include in our perspective access to this whole genome sequencing analysis and reporting tools to those who need to know take action. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark, for setting the scene for today's discussions. Our next speaker is Professor Guido Werner. Guido is the, he heads the division of nosocomial pathogens and AMR and the National Reference Center for Staphylococci and Enterococci at the Robert Koch Institute in Germany. His research interests include molecular diagnostics, strain typing, and other biological and epidemiological aspects of AMR. He's been a principal investigator for uh, and coordinator of many uh, international and national research projects, and he serves as a national expert to the European Commission. Welcome, Guido. Over to you. Oh, thank you, Lee, for the nice introduction and for um, having us all here for this um, really exciting experience. Uh, and thanks for Mark. Uh, thanks to Mark for setting the scene for for these next uh, presentations uh, to come. So I pulled the short match and uh, uh, to explain to you the technical issues, so the material and methods section. But I can reassure you, it's not getting really technical. So we, as medical microbiologists, we we diagnose diseases and we diagnose bacteria, viruses, fungi, and so on. Uh, in order to extract uh, therapeutically relevant information, we like to know what kind of species we have, uh, what is the antibiotic susceptibility profile, and if, for instance, uh, some of these bacteria are capable to produce toxins that are di disease related. With whole genome sequencing, we have a one size fits all technique that, in principle and in general, allows to extract all the diagnostically relevant information. And in addition, and this was the entry door for this technology, it allows strain typing on the basis of genomic comparisons. So whole genome sequencing comparisons allow the ultimate death or the ultimate discriminatory power to infer or disprove a relatedness between uh, corresponding pathogens. And as we've already heard by Mark, this is highly relevant for, for instance, outbreak analysis or for following pandemic spread of viruses, for tracing and tracking of pathogens, for source identification, for instance, in case of foodborne outbreaks, and in general for genomic pathogen and resistance surveillance. Whole genome sequencing has several advantages, for instance, in terms of standardization, scalability, reliability and reproducibility, speed and accuracy. And this has led to the situation that whole genome sequencing has replaced all other typing techniques due to these advantages. And this is uh, partly shown in this um, image, uh, which is one of the figures of the papers to be discussed. On the left-hand side, you see different forms of diagnostic samples that ISO flew via a culture-based diagnostics flow which is shown on the left side, uh, finally ending up with some kind of molecular analysis and including partly whole genome sequencing, or on the other hand, and in the middle graph shown, 
By a metagenomics approach where the DNA or the RNA is isolated and then sequenced. So finally, in, in the middle image, we see that all this relevant information uh, is then used for patient treatment or in case um, of supposed outbreaks in single hospitals for outbreak control. So this is the view for the single hospital or for the single entity. Um, so Sanger sequencing was the first um, sequencing technology and the last 15 to 20 years have seen several other uh, whole genome sequencing uh, techniques. They are called uh, short read sequencing and long read sequencing. Uh, and uh, so the first one, which is also called next generation sequencing, the principle is that we generate high numbers of short DNA stretches, which show a high base accuracy. And it demands high computational bioinformatic efforts to reconstruct genomes and to delineate the corresponding diagnostic uh, information. In recent years, huge efforts have been made to make these analyses highly parallel, meaning to have many samples in a single run, which is also called multiplexing. And this is run on high throughput machines, which saves time and costs compared to the um, early procedures. Another technique, which is called third generation or long read sequencing, circumvents the drawbacks of the next generation sequencing technologies by generating very long DNA stretches, but initially at the expense of lower base accuracy and much higher costs for the machines and for the single sequencing run. There are specific technologies which are highly portable, less technically demanding, and which allow field applications and which became prominent during the Ebola outbreak uh, several years ago uh, in Africa. So which is central to this paper and this talk today, it's uh, genomic pathogen and resistance surveillance. And here we can um, um, deduce that the promise of whole genome sequencing has turned our um, philosophy or approach, how we do it upside down. So samples are no longer collected by clinical and epidemiological suspicion as we have done it for decades and centuries. Nowadays, we can start with huge isolate collections that are prospectively collected, massively genome sequenced and subjected to semi-automated and parallelized data analysis. And what we want to do is to investigate potential relatedness of strains, meaning tracing and tracking of pathogens. We generate transmission hypotheses and identify sources, again, with the example of foodborne outbreaks, for instance. And we can identify completely new pathogens or pathogens with novel virulence and resistance properties. And this is again shown. So the first image was describing the flow chart of a single hospital. So here it's more on a, on a general federal or state level, meaning again, we start with a number of diagnostic samples from a range of hospitals that finally end up with some kind of molecular or genomic data. And these genomic data are then deposited in centralized databases. And these centralized databases allow then again cluster analysis, phylogenetic analysis to um, identify outbreaks that um, cross the border of a single hospital or a single or for, for a state or identify new variants, uh, which is called uh, during the SARS-CoV-2 crisis variants of concern. However, this could also be a bacterial or a fungal pathogen, a variant of concern. So what's the way forward then? So the current approaches in genomic sequencing combine the best of the two worlds. So we use long reads to completely reconstruct full genomes, where the focus is to reconstruct the many mobile genetic elements that mainly carry the diagnostically relevant information, the virulence genes we would like to identify and the resistance properties. And we are using short reads to allow high 
um, high base accuracies to reconstruct the phylogenetic relatedness of the strains since these single nucleotide polymorphisms are used uh, to um, infer the phylogenetic relatedness. We have seen novel chemical, technical and bioinformatic approaches that allow already now a single technology approach. And this is, for instance, shown um, uh, or discussed in the paper on the right side, uh, which describes a nanopore only um, assembly for genomic surveillance of Klebsiella pneumoniae. What will be the ultimate challenge is to extrapolate and predict future public health and infectious disease challenges on the basis of these huge and comprehensive data sets that we are now generating. Another way forward is, for instance, to guide patient therapy and to do resistance and pathogen surveillance by using a single approach. We have seen in recent years several papers describing to extract antibiotic resistance properties only by genome data. And we had the privilege together with some colleagues to write a nice spotlight article flanking uh, this publication, which is shown here. And with my very last slide, I would hand over to my colleague Vitaly, who's giving the next presentation by showing that, of course, the um, opportunities of whole genome sequencing are laid down now in many national and international action plans and activities. And these are mainly uh, supported also by world um, leading organizations in health like WHO, US CDC, the European CDC and the European Food Safety Authority, just to mention a few of them. And with this, I would like to hand over to Lee. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Guido. Questions are already coming through in the uh, in the Q&A, as you can all see, and please do keep them coming. We'll get to as many of them as we can at the end. In the meantime, it's over to Professor Vitaly Sinchenko at the University of Sydney in Australia. There, Vitaly directs the Centre for Infectious Diseases and Microbiology, Public Health, a translational research hub working to improve laboratory and epidemiological investigation of communicable disease outbreaks and transmission. His work includes genomics guided surveillance of respiratory, foodborne, and other bacterial diseases with epidemic potential. He linked linking genomic, epidemiological, and clinical data. And today, Vitaly is going to speak to us about integrative solutions for surveillance data sharing. Welcome, Vitaly. Over to you. Thank you, Lee. Um, and thanks to my esteemed colleagues. Um, Mark and Guida for the introduction and for the opportunity to participate in, in this exciting project. Um, I'm talking to you from uh, Australia today, and I wish to acknowledge the um, Gedical people of the Euro, Euro nation as uh, traditional owners and custodians of the land I'm meeting with you today and pay my respects to their eldest past, present and emerging. Um, I would like to very briefly introduce two themes um, which are properly unpacked in the Frontiers article we are discussing today. The first one is sequencing data integration, which um, is uh, required to achieve the uh, ambitious objectives that we have for uh, genomic systems um, uh, to control communicable diseases. And um, this um, depends really on um, the scope and a scale of genomic surveillance. And uh, um, Mark and uh, Guda already mentioned uh, some powerful examples of this, um, where um, these models started with large retros retrospective reviews of um, samples sequenced in batches so-called macroepidemiology approach, um, and uh, it provided data on decade, decades of samples. We uh, have done, um, as a community, uh, a lot of um, studies uh, when um, sequencing was used to confirm uh, or explore suspected epidemiological hypotheses in relation to a particular community 
a hospital acquired um, outbreaks uh, and the paradigm is really shifting to prospective proactive sequencing for real-time outbreak detection and generation of uh, epidemiological hypotheses from genomic data um, and clearly this new exciting paradigm put more dependency on data linkage and integration and such dependency on integration of laboratory and clinical and public health metadata with sequencing um, has been uh, described in multiple policy guidelines strategic documents some of which are uh, captured here uh, and uh, on a figure um, that uh, illustrates uh, uh, capacity linkages between microbiology genomics informatics and epidemiology um, whether they can be developed within one organization or are based on collaboration between uh, relevant public health laboratories, academic institutions, and other stakeholders. The figure on the right illustrates uh, two key points uh, required for such integration. One is alignment of data types and methods with uh, epidemiological research uh, questions that uh, surveillance uh, or sequencing is addressing. Um, and uh, clearly, um, integration of data or sharing of data uh, in a raw sequencing format or inference data uh, can be applied depending on such uh, circumstances and uh, governance schemes for genomic surveillance. And secondly, um, that uh, long read short read sequencing sequencing of microorganisms or direct sequencing of clinical samples using targeted ngs metagenomic approaches are also used extensively to achieve um, sequencing uh, objectives and uh, uh, these technologies can be linked successfully with um, appropriate metadata types and uh, uh, processing of data to eliminate, uh, for example, human DNA to achieve um, genomic surveillance objectives. The added value of such integration uh, is also depend, um, affected by capacity to communicate effectively uh, to end users to present genomic results to communities of practice and here uh, i'm just showing the example of cumulative reporting of genomic surveillance um, that uh, was introduced during the pandemic um, and uh, the covid 19 um, really catalyzed um, the uptake of genomic surveillance for public health control the epi fish plot here um, for um, uh, tracking of transmission within one state uh, and this examples from australia from new south wales in our uh, real life um, illustrating the rise and fall of uh, uh, clusters of uh, sars cov2 virus uh, over the course of the pandemic in 2021 um, uh, plotted by epidemiological week and the height of the plot at each week <laughs> vertical white line um, is proportional to the total number of genomes obtained from cases sampled at that week and colors represent di different clusters uh, defined by genomic similarity um, so the more clusters we have more cases we have within clusters the larger the, you know, the size of that particular plot and you can see that initially we had multiple clusters due to independent multiple introductions of the infection to Australia and then um, border closures, lockdown measures reduced um, this, uh, the number of clusters and we ended up with two 
co-circulating clones later on, but eventually managed to control the local transmission with uh, public health measures. And uh, clearly, genomic surveillance played a quite important role in guiding public health interventions at the time. Um, the second theme, um, which is uh, um, described in the article, is design of national surveillance systems. And um, these design considerations uh, usually start with a scan of the country and the disease um, along three uh, dimensions. One is a disease threat assessment, um, whether uh, one is looking at uh, surveillance of uh, low incidence disease or high incidence endemic disease, which is subject to national disease control program, etc. Laboratory capacity on the ground in the second dimension, um, gra grading from low to high, um, which sup supports genomic uh, surveillance and uh, provides bioinformatics infrastructure and analy analy analytics uh, capacity. But equally important is a third dimension, public health response, capacity of uh, uh, public health uh, to address, to act upon um, new data, uh, new signals offered by genomic surveillance. And this capacity is being developed. Um, it might be limited in some uh, settings uh, and can be very strong for other diseases uh, in the same uh, country or state. So when um, such um, scanning is uh, uh, conducted, um, assessment um, can progress to best fit model um, uh, design. Um, and um, um, this uh, just an example of the metrics that uh, um, have been discussed um, by uh, colleagues, and we put uh, um, some um, uh, local experiences from uh, high incidence countries, low incident countries into this consideration um, that uh, provides uh, choices and assessment of expected utility of genomic surveillance for particular disease. And uh, uh, in a country with moderate laboratory capacity, and uh, as an example, uh, in the middle, uh, and uh, low, low disease threat for particular condition and uh, limited public health response, one could expect um, low expected utility of genomic surveillance. And in contrast, um, in the right um, uh, side, um, when uh, moderate or high uh, laboratory capacity setting addresses um, significant uh, threat um, and has uh, cap capacity to uh, act upon such information, uh, obviously um, decision, decision tree assessment with a higher utility of genomic surveillance uh, is performed. So there is a, a lot more value um, can be expected from genomic surveillance when these um, uh, three conditions are met. I would also um, would like to uh, mention another core idea of the assessment of uh, uh, utility uh, of genomic surveillance and especially utility uh, of sharing the data. This uh, uh, concept of collaboration and collaboration that Mark mentioned um, in his introduction. Um, this uh, um, figure on the left um, shows uh, um, that uh, with high density of sampling um, of populations of cases, so when cases are diagnosed and uh, samples or cultures are subjected to whole genome sequencing and a proportion of uh, cases which are sequenced uh, is substantial 
and this data is shared rapidly um, with um, collaborating partners, the uh, value, the public health utility of such uh, sequencing data for disease control is significantly higher. So disease uh, sampling for sequencing is uh, uh, a key feature for uh, enabling su success as well as timeliness uh, or recency of sequencing data sharing um, with a minimal uh, lag between sample collection and data sharing are two key um, features that I would like to highlight. Of course, quality of sequencing data uh, for sharing availability of metadata to contextualize uh, such uh, information are also important. And when they're addressed, this orthodoxies of public health laboratory surveillance as a documentation of past failures can be um, reconsidered and showed that uh, um, public health laboratory surveillance can be quite uh, instrumental in making real-time changes. And in many ways, um, public health laboratory surveillance now attracts uh, attention, uh, not just reference laboratories within um, different countries, but uh, um, clinical laboratories, diagnostic um, pathology service providers, academic centers, um, and um, other stakeholders in this evolving space. When we talk about data integration, especially data sharing in, uh, between partners at a national level, at the international level, benefits and challenges or risks of data sharing need to be addressed. And uh, um, uh, these risks uh, or benefits uh, uh, can be divided uh, as uh, risks uh, attributed to data providers and data recipients. I don't want to um, go into each individual in, uh, item in detail, uh, just on an overview level. Of course, uh, enhanced surveillance for infectious diseases uh, through genomic surveillance is a major benefit. Precision public health, as we try to call it, um, improves uh, recognition of uh, clusters, especially multi-jurisdictional international clusters, as um, has been shown in, in previous um, summaries. And uh, it leads to knowledge discovery, to uh, important uh, uh, trust and integrity or reciprocity aspects and uh, uh, new um, markers, markets for uh, genomic diagnostics, for vaccines, for, um, for um, um, antimicrobial agents, etc. Uh, and data recipients uh, are especially um, important beneficiaries of such data sharing. Um, when um, integration uh, of um, data is considered, uh, um, these challenges and risks are equally need to be addressed through appropriate governance to ensure that uh, um, there is no missed opportunity for precision public health, to ensure data security um, and uh, data privacy and confidentiality um, according to uh, local uh, regional legislations and uh, frameworks and accountability of data recipients um, that are um, reanalyzing the data uh, and uh, using this data for secondary reuse, ensuring recognition and attribution uh, of uh, data sharing by uh, providers um, and uh, addressing potential incidental findings from data reuse, ensuring that uh, um, this data is reused appropriately and invalid interpretation of local data uh, uh, is um, uh, 
addressed and the risk of such events uh, are minimized. So um, I think this it was my last slide uh, and uh, I would like to thank you for, for your attention and pass um, the um, slides to the next speaker, to Margaret. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vitaly, and uh, for that comprehensive overview of a very complex issue um, of informatics. And actually, I see that last slide perhaps spoke to many of the questions um, coming through in the chat, actually, with respect to some of the, the challenges and uh, benefits of, uh, of, of, of data itself. Um, do keep your questions coming through. As I said before, we'll try and get to as many as we can at the end. But beforehand, our next speaker is Professor Margaret Ip from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Margaret is a leading clinical microbiologist whose research includes the development and assessment of clinical diagnostic methods and new treatment modalities. Her team track changes relating to colonization and infection serotypes, virulence, and the acquisition of resistance determinants. Today, Margaret's going to talk to us about One Health collaborations for epidemic preparedness. Margaret, welcome. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Lee and Frontiers, uh, for this uh, event. And also, of course, uh, Mark and colleagues uh, for inviting me to join this very important project. Well, COVID-19 pandemic really highlighted the need for to enhance the capacity to determine emerging diseases. Prior to the uh, pandemic, um, we experienced uh, quite a number of um, outbreaks and epidemics, and economically, it really impacted uh, you know, us, uh, particularly in Hong Kong, for SARS-1, SARS-CoV-1, and the H5N1. As you can see on the right, uh, this was the uh, estimated economic impact for the um, outbreak of SARS-CoV-1 back in 2003. It hit us very, very hard and it estimated to have costed 30 to 50 billion. And subsequent to that, in um, 1990, well, back in with the H5N1, of course, we also experienced this um, from our poultry uh, wet market. Uh, and similarly, uh, it led to uh, a substantial um, you know, uh, burden of disease as it is a highly pathogenic uh, virus. And subsequent to that, there also have been sporadic cases uh, in Southeast Asia and in China. Uh, H1N1, of course, the swine flu, which led to a pandemic. Uh, luckily, it was uh, a more a milder form of the uh, variant influenza. Uh, but of course, it is now part of our seasonal influenza as well and estimated uh, impact economically of um, you know, 50 uh, billion. And, and then, of course, there's the Ebola uh, outbreaks uh, in West Africa. But for COVID-19, um, estimates of this, in fact, went through the roof from you know, 10 to hundreds of thousands of trillions, in fact. Um, so it really shows you know, how this uh, impact our lives and the economy, uh, not only uh, you know, with um, you know, humans, for, with us, uh, the morbidity and the mortality, as well as our lives, uh, you know, which changed substantially during the uh, pandemic. So uh, there is a huge heterogeneity of um, coronaviruses. Uh, these are some of the newly discovered um, coronaviruses in the last decades. Uh, you can see that highlighted in red uh, that cause highly uh, pathogenic uh, infectious diseases with severe infection are the SARS-CoV-1 uh, back in 2003 and then the MERS-CoV from the Middle East uh, in 2009. And, but aside from this, uh, there are also four other uh, more common you know, respiratory viruses also uh, due to corona, uh, coronavirus. Um, and these are you know, commonly you know, seen in um, common colds and upper respiratory tract infections. Now, all these viruses are believed to have originated from bats. Um, and uh, with uh, spill over to various intermediate hosts uh, with different uh, mammals. 
uh, as you can see. And over the last few decades, you can see that um, many of the important emerging pathogens are uh, arisen from uh, with a zoonotic origin from animals. And this dates back to even the HIV back in 1986, which was discovered and uh, related to the simian immunodeficiency virus. Uh, and that brought a huge sort of um, public health uh, emergency at the time. And subsequent to that, uh, we have the BSE, bovine spongy form and cephalopathy, uh, as a result of the uh, cattle feed, which was contaminated uh, and leading to uh, cases of uh, sporadic uh, Creutzfeldt Jakob diseases in humans. And of course, in 1997, we had the avian influenza outbreak where we had to slaughter uh, one and a half million chickens just before the new year. Uh, within a day uh, in order to curb the um, you know, transmission to humans, uh, where we had 18, 18 cases and 33% uh, mortality at the time. And it was uh, identified that you know, uh, due to the poultry, where we had uh, wet markets uh, selling live you know, chickens. And after that, of course, we experienced SARS-CoV-1 uh, back in 2003 that hit us really, really hard. After this, we also experienced like, you know, this is more a pandemic that affected globally uh, the public health um, with the swine influenza H1N1 uh, back in 2009. And of course, uh, you know, it doesn't stop here. Uh, we at the MERS-CoV, uh, which was discovered uh, first case in tw uh, 2012. And then the Zika virus from Brazil, uh, that also affected millions. And the avian influenza due to H7N9, I think this originated uh, in, in China, not Africa, but subsequent to that, there are sporadic cases uh, throughout you know, in many countries. Uh, And uh, the Ebola virus, um, of course, the outbreak uh, during 2014 to 2016 uh, in uh, countries uh, in West Africa. And, and of course, now uh, in 2019 with the SARS -CoV the COVID-19. And, um, and this continues with our H5N1 recently. Uh, found in dairy cattle and uh, farmer, as well as uh, monkeypox virus, which we also have to deal with. So this leads on to the One Health, where um, the concept of integration of people, animals, and our ecosystem, where they are connected, uh, interlinked very, very closely. And that involves a lot of um, various stakeholders, and importantly, the four C's for capacity building, communication, good coordination, and collaboration between these stakeholders. So just going back to you know, human and animal host um, transmission, you all know during the uh, COVID-19, we have uh, mink farms, uh, with minks being infected. And of course that can spill over to the wildlife in the surrounding area and creating the reservoirs that can spill back to the humans uh, eventually and to the farmers. Uh, so um, this is how the you know, dynamics between the human and the host and how these infectious agents may cross species um, you know, to new host and adapt it uh, and then spill back to our humans. You know, Similarly, with influenza virus, uh, you know, which is well known to cause uh, cross infections between humans and the uh, animal host uh, in here, for example, with the pigs and uh, humans uh, leading to a reassortment and new variant strains. So besides um, uh, the animals and the uh, uh, people, 
there are drivers that can select you know, for changes. And importantly, in recent time, we have more de deforestation, climate change, intensive farming, uh, use of antimicrobials in farms, urbanization, overcrowding, and uh, global mobilization. And this all add to the factors uh, for transmission to take place. So um, within these uh, aspects, you know, we also look at within this, the global warming, contamination from uh, antimicrobials, humans with our aging population, overcrowding, uh, increased small comorbidities, uh, that also increase the severity for diseases to manifest and uh, for transmission to take place. And of course, in the animal husbandry and aquaculture, uh, together with the use of antimicrobials, um, uh, that add on to uh, these uh, drivers for these uh, emerging um, introduction of uh, variants uh, that lead to uh, transmission and outbreaks and uh, epidemics. Uh, examples of this also with the antimicrobial use in animal husbandry for sustainable food uh, also led to a massive um, you know, uh, contamination with uh, drug resistant uh, bacteria with ESBL and carbapenemases from farms and environment. Uh, this also results in pathogens uh, potentially, uh, which can be of concern for food safety, uh, as well as being selected out for uh, survival uh, with specific clonotypes uh, that may lead to more invasive diseases. Uh, that being said, I, I think this is one illustration of a specific clone that was confirmed through whole genome sequencing, uh, which is a very clonal strain type that caused invasive diseases in Southeast Asia. Uh, particularly, we uh, really uh, saw this um, in Singapore and Hong Kong, and now it is also known around in uh, other parts of other countries in Vietnam, Thailand, and Cambodia. Um, besides that, there are also other bacteria such as the uh, hemorrhagic E. coli that led to outbreaks uh, from salads, uh, et cetera. So really, um, both infectious diseases and antimicrobial resistance surveillance are very important uh, and looked globally you know, across uh, under One Health uh, because these are the stakeholders uh, that have to be engaged. And this enhanced the um, communication between the important partners, uh, as well as to uh, take the actions uh, subsequently in order to control, understand, and prevent these uh, infections to take place. And with this plan, uh, it is hoped that we can strengthen health capacities, reduce the risk for pandemics, and epidemics, control to these zoonotic diseases, strengthen the assessment, management, and the communications, and to curb these um, with AMR, the silent pandemic, uh, and to be able to integrate uh, the environmental factors uh, across um, the ecosystem. So this is really an investment case. If you go back to the first slide on the economic burden and the cost uh, you know, from an outbreak, uh, how much are we willing to pay uh, in order to contain and control the next one? So we may have to do much more uh, monitoring with the re or emergence of zoonotic diseases at local level, community level, uh, with being able to detect the signals when there is uh, increased spread. And uh, of course, a lot of network communication locally with the individual stakeholders, uh, nationally, regionally, and globally uh, in order to tackle these threats uh, to health and the ecosystem to address uh, and take plans of actions. So, um, our ultimate goal is really to be able to sustain health and well-being for everyone uh, so that we are able to reduce the risk uh, posed by these emerging zoonotic diseases and to be able to detect early signals for increased um, outbreak or transmission and to be able to control and prevent these uh, diseases uh, 
and to understand characteristics to make the uh, necessary preventative strategies uh, in coding, uh, to contain these emerging diseases, uh, which are of health, public health risk globally. So with that, I finish here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Beautiful. Okay. Well, that uh, concludes the, the end of the presentations that, uh, discussing the various facets of the article and frontiers of science, uh, frontiers in science that we've been discussing. We're now going to have a, um, a, a panel discussion, uh, bearing in mind, uh, raising, sorry, based on the issues that, uh, that Mark and Guido and Vitali and Margaret have all raised. And I'm also ple pleased to uh, welcome two additional guests as well. Dr. Stephen Morse uh, co-authored the Policy Outlook in the article hub uh, on this topic. He's presently Senior Scientific Advisor at IHRC Inc. in Atlanta. Prior to that, he had a long and distinguished career at the US CDC, uh, holding various high-level positions, including Associate Director for Environmental Microbiology. Among his many achievements included the National Laboratory Response Network. In addition, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Josefina Campos from the World Health Organization. Josefina heads the Unit for Genomics and Analytics in the Division of Health Emergency Intelligence and Surveillance Systems. Before that, she directed, uh, sorry, she was served within the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence, uh, advising the recently established International Pathogen Surveillance Network. And before that, she was the director of the National Genomics and Bioinformatics Center in Argentina. So welcome, Josefina, and to Stephen, uh, and for joining us today. We'll take some audience questions shortly, but first of all, just to welcome our new guests. Um, Stephen, if I could turn to you first, please. Um, so how far we've heard from presenters from various parts of the world, but from the United States perspective, how would you describe the state of play of genomic pathogen surveillance at the moment? And what initiatives are underway at national level, uh, federal level, and, and where are the good practices at state level as well? well thank, thank, you for the, thank you for the question. What I'd like to do is to talk about activities that are occurring at both the federal level, state level, and local level. And I think as an example, let me talk about the use of whole genome sequencing for foodborne illnesses. Uh, in the United States, foodborne illness is investigated by three federal agencies, the Food and Drug Administration, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Food Safety Inspection Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, about 20 years ago, CDC developed a well, surveillance system called PulseNet, which used pulse field gel electrophoresis to type patient isolates from foodborne illnesses. That is currently being moved now to whole genome sequencing. A few years ago, the Food and Drug Administration developed a database called the Genome Tracker which contains whole genome sequences of E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and Listeria from outbreaks of foodborne illness. So now in uh, surveillance for foodborne illness, CDC sends whole genome sequencing data to FDA to the Genome Tracker database. USDA sends whole genome sequencing data to the, to the genome tracker database. And this database is uh, One Health oriented, where there are clinical, domestic animal, food, and environmental whole genome sequencing data, which can be used to investigate outbreaks of foodborne illness. Um, states are uh, developing the capability of doing whole genome sequencing in their public health laboratories, and there are a number of training initiatives that are ongoing to provide bioinformatics training to the, the, to the states so they can fully integrate whole genome sequencing in their uh, routine uh, 
act in in their routine. Um, Blocking on the word routine activities. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks for giving us that overview. I'm sure we'll come back to some of those aspects in just a second, but let me also bring in Josefina. Josefina, uh, again, doubtless we'll discuss the WHO and the new uh, surveillance network soon. But just before we get to that, from previously, from your own experience and your own work in Argentina, um, could you give us a sense of the, the state of play uh, in 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 Argentina specifically, and and perhaps elsewhere in in South America, if that's possible. Hello, Josefina. Do we have you there? Sure. So um, the, the ah yes. Can Super. you hear me? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can see yeah. and hear Perfect. you as well. It's a little Thank delayed, you. but we'll, we should be okay. Okay. So I think it has to do with the existing capacity of surveillance and laboratory system. And this is how we started in Argentina after COVID-19 and how we can uh, optimize the use of um, genomic sequencing. Even we started using before COVID-19. I think that is where we deploy our capacity. And from the Argentinian perspective, we, we created the Argentinian Genomic Network. It's a federal network where we extended the capacity to the um, provinces. And the idea is to generate from a centralized um, laboratory network, but also decentralizing to the provinces with uh, minor capacity. And with that end, depending the use, is how we are going to utilize uh, genomic uh, systems into the surveillance. I think the most critical challenge here has to do with how we do collaborative surveillance, because in Argentina, we already have more than 40 networks, laboratory networks that work perfectly fine and have a surveillance system established for more than 20 years. So we did have uh, the, the um, uh, actually the, um, the way of how to merge all these networks together and how to work through genomics and make sure we use the same nodes for the genomic network and from the other laboratory network. In the same view is uh, the Latin American level. We also have different networks that has been used in genomics before the pandemic from Pulse in Latin America and the Caribbean, Relabra for AMR, uh, RELDA for aroviruses. But lately, PAHO uh, created an overarching uh, network called the PAHOGEN that it wants to establish this capacity and make sure we can have a multi-pathogen approach to use this capacity at the most. Right. Maybe while we, we've had various questions in about collaboration and the, 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 the fact that countries or even within and certainly between countries is parallel sort of discrete activities, if you like, underway often in many regions, but that collaboration. Could you perhaps explain the, the, the new or relatively newly established network at WHO and, and the role that is envisaged to play uh, in, in, in building a sort of a collaborative uh, global approach? Yes, of course. So the IPSN was a, it's a global network that brings together the pathogen genomic complex community to improve public health decision making with the objective that every country has equitably access to sustained capacity of pathogen genomic sequencing. We embrace the complexity of pathogen genomic sequencing community, and we also have a One Health approach that includes national and regional public health lab, animal and environmental health sector, policymakers and donors, among others. We were launched a year ago in May 2023, and it had grown to 104 partners across 45 countries already. And we provide technical support to other programs across the house using genomic technology with a One Health approach. Uh, through our funder forum, we convened 4 million US dollars for catalytic grant funds to support the IPSN theory of change in lower middle income countries. And in this first round, we received more than 200 applications with geographically coverage of the, C w the, the six WHO regions and many innovative approach um, from lower middle income countries. We have different bodies, including the Founder Forum, the Country Skill Up Accelerators, and the Community of Practice on Data and Environmental and vector genomic surveillance. Right. I mean, specifically, perhaps I could broaden this out as well, and 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 um, uh, perhaps uh, we can have several inputs on this one. We've had several questions in respect with respect to specifically capacity building in lower middle income countries. The article uh, points to the variation in the levels of implementation currently that exist. Um, 
And um, maybe before we move on, Josephine, quickly from your point, what, what from your perspective are the priorities for capacity building? Where are the blockers? And then we'll perhaps we'll broaden it out. Perhaps Mark, if you'd like to comment, and and, and Guido, and as as well, perhaps on technically. But first of all, Josephine, quickly, if you would. Oh. Do we have you still? Yes, here? of course. So from capacity building, I think we have to have in mind the different levels. So, yes, can you hear me? Just about. Yeah, do please continue. Okay, yes. Yeah, so we need to have in mind the three different levels from the wet lab and the surveillance system, the um, analytics and the interpretation of that analytics and how this is embedded in the public health system itself. So at the policy uh, makers stage. So the capacity building needs to have all that in mind. But also, also we need to have the different surveillance models. So we develop a country capacity framework that uh, includes end-to-end -end capacity, regional hubs, and also global leaders that we will support this global model. And I think this is very important to have in mind when we think about this. Of course, about prioritization exercise and which uh, are the next steps that countries should take that, of course, have regional caveats and realities and, of course, national as well. So I think the capacity building needs to have in mind all these different steps. Right, Guido. If I could turn to you, you mentioned uh, in your in the in the sort of review of the technical aspects, the various methodologies um, that the newer some of the newer technologies for sequencing are becoming more um, more uh, accessible, if you like, and lower cost. Could you just expand a little bit on that and and the, the importance of this and, and and further developments in that way for uh, lower income settings in particular. We've had several questions about this. Okay, thank you, Lee. Uh, so we, we have seen it as I shortly introduced during my presentation um, already during the Ebola crisis, how portable and scalable the system uh, by a British company uh, could uh, be brought directly to the area of action. So we have um, a technology that is uh, capable for field applications and that does not require so um, high technical demands. Uh, and, and with this technology at hand, um, it is possible to bring genomic sequencing wherever you want to, to have it. Um, and uh, in this case, it's either used for diagnostics, but also for public health purposes for tracing and tracking of pathogens. And in, in this case of a highly deadly uh, virus, However, you can also bring it to, um, to analyze any other pathogen of interest. And this um, makes a huge difference to uh, the, the machines we had so far, which have high technical demands, um, uh, which also require a, a stable infrastructure uh, in terms of electricity and safety and, and biosafety and so on. Um, and, and, and with this technology at hand, I think we, we have moved a huge step forward also to bring uh, it to uh, the areas uh, that are less well equipped, as we discussed it. And I've also seen it in the chat and in the Q&A session that this was a major issue, the difference between the well equipped industrialized countries and the low and middle income countries, where, where there is for sure a difference in applicability of this technology. Yeah, similarly, as, as well as the, the the sequencing technologies, there's also the, I guess, the bioinformatics and the analytic capacities. Vitaly, could I ask you to take that up um, with respect to those tools, the integration of uh, of clinical, epidemiological, and uh, and genomic data, and what's this? What what's the routes, if you like, to better share tools, analytic platforms, etc., to ensure that there's a a more equitable approach across the world. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, this is um, area of active discussions between um, partners uh, at the national meetings and uh, the networks that Josephine um, mentioned and professional societies. Clearly, uh, uh, bioinformatics tools um, have matured a lot, <laughs> um, and we have uh, now uh, several platforms um, that uh, um, have been successfully used, pipelines that have been successfully used. Many of these pipelines are pathogen specific for you know, typhoid or for like a bacterium tuberculosis or COVID, et cetera. Some of these pipe pipelines are agnostic. 
Um, there are pipelines for sharing of data as well uh, being developed uh, with support from international agencies that um, could be scaled to different settings, including low uh, you know, the settings that currently struggle with accessing this. Uh, I can mention you know, GPAS, for example, Global Pathogen Analysis System, as, a, as an example. Um, and uh, the, in, on a national, federal level and uh, international level, um, there are documents um, being developed for governance of um, integration and sharing of this data. Because um, I just want to highlight that uh, uh, it's not just sharing of sequences uh, al alone. Metadata is equally important. And if we Men, if we don't share metadata, we, to a large extent, reduce the impact of this data sh data sharing as well. And uh, WHO, of course, um, has been working hard in in that space. Um, and uh, um, workforce capacity <laughs> uh, is a globally recognized problem, and I think as a community. Um, we need to take responsibility for this and maybe leading laboratories in the US, in Europe, uh, in Australia should uh, uh, be more proactive in training uh, colleagues yeah. um, in, uh, in regions that uh, are interested um, to, in this space and uh, supporting uh, analyses, developing local capacity at the end of the day it's important. And uh, I just wanted to pick up on uh, Gita's point about um, benchtop analyzers that are being available now. Um, sequencing of multiple pathogens. When you think about uh, surveillance, it's not silos of tuberculosis, foodborne diseases, uh, or you know, COVID respiratory diseases. A lot of things things can be sequenced on the same run, delivering timely information and scaling up this capacity for smaller jurisdictions that don't have, obviously, thousands of thousands of samples every week. Thank you. Thanks, Vitaly. Margaret, if I could turn to you, we've had several questions in with respect to uh, evolution of pathogens, the, the prospect of even predicting evolution uh, of these pathogens, um, obviously triggered by the the what happened with uh, with with SARS uh, CoV two, um, both once it had emerged and then the, the tracking of its evolution, if you like. But what what about prediction? Do we have progress in in being able to um, to track the, the the evolution towards um, a pandemic potential? Can you update us on that? Well. Um, well. Well, firstly, I'm not a virologist, and I have not have my track working on emerging viruses, but I do know people who have been tracking. Of course, Hong Kong is like an epicenter you know, for the SARS-CoV-1, and uh, I have my collaborators who actually spoke on the prediction of the next coronavirus uh, in a keynote at some point you know, in ACBIT, actually, previously. So there's data. I mean, for example, I think even with this dairy cattle, with the uh, avian influenza, uh, there are already speculations on which you know, mutation that are more uh, susceptible to a high pathogenicity or with the receptor binding protein that are, you know, uh, that, that are uh, with high affinity to humans. So I think there are specific pointers uh, for the individual researcher who look at these emerging viruses and emerging pathogens uh, phylogenetically and evolutionary. Uh, point of view uh, to predict certain aspects. Um, I mean, in terms of the AMR, of course, we look at the um, you know, resistance determinants. We look at the uh, transmissible uh, you know, mobile genetic elements uh, that enable it to transmit. And of course, with the laboratory uh, support that can uh, translate uh, further to its potential for transmission, possibly like duplicate plasmids or duplicate genes, you know, there, are, there are increasing publications on those aspects. Um, but of course, for bacteriology, we need a lot more um, uh, laboratory 
proof and evidence uh, to support this. Uh, but in terms of virology, particularly these emerging viruses, uh, I think there has been a lot of you know, yeah. uh, literature you know, to, to give pointers on which are the specific uh, mutations or genes that are localized that can lead to increased virulence or, or uh, potential to spread in humans. Okay, we're nearing the end of the session. I'm going to give just two final quick questions I'm going to ask. First of all, um, Stephen, just I, to bring you back may, in. Oh, I, of course. Sorry. Uh, just, just perhaps yes. if I may, Lee, just, just to come on, on the last question, perhaps uh, on, on the predictive power of genomics. I think Arne Koopman in our editorial made a good point that we still need to go hand in hand phenotype versus genotype. Sequencing cannot tell us the whole story and nature keeps surprising us. So to actually characterizing full organ for the phenotype and validating functional genomics by back and forth exercise is equally important. Therefore, arrangement for referral of material bio banking is equally important. Okay. Right. I was just going to come back to Stephen briefly. Mark, I, I have a question to come back to you on, on perhaps for the closing remarks at the end. But um, just briefly, Stephen, to bring you back in from a US perspective, um, what you've you've seen, you've seen 30 years, three decades or so of progress toward this um, implementation, you, the, the value case, if you like, for we've had one or two questions about the value, if you like, policymakers, decision makers need to see value for an intervention in, in order to invest in it. And Margaret mentioned that too. Do you, do you see a, a bright future for the investment in these systems in the US, which, for example, over the next five years or so? Yes, I do. I think that as we transition from um, more labor intensive methods uh, for doing surveillance to a, a whole genome sequencing, uh, we'll be much more efficient and much more cost effective in uh, investigating out outbreaks of of, Ill, of illness. So I see a bright, a bright future for this. That's good to know. Oh, I lost my video. That's great to know. Thank you, Stephen. Lastly, Mark, if we could, uh, we're close to the end now. Um, you were the inspiration. Of course, you brought this article um, through. And I'd like to ask you to bring you back, Mark, to one of the comments you made earlier about the WHO, the uh, the pandemic agreement and uh, the, the the discussions that are going to take place over the coming months about that. Um, summing up everything we've heard today, everything you've written about with your colleagues, um, what messages would you have for the for, for for the decision makers who are going to construct that uh, that agreement and and uh, and perhaps also to the scientific community? Um, what should we be working toward over the next twelve months to put systems in place that will last? into the coming years, into the through the next decade? That's a very vast question, Lee, but I believe that we are on the right track. Also, the, the comments made in the chat and the Q&A indicate that there is a really a, a globally perceived need for building capacity and empowering genomic surveillance for public health. So the question of how we can build the various uh, governments and infrastructure and, and training for capabilities across uh, nations and clearly the discussion that took place during the World Health Agency, uh, World Health Assembly, sorry, uh, indicate by the adoption of amendments to the RHR that the recognition to do more to deploy equitably this kind of tools to prepare and respond better to future pandemic emergency is the right way to go and there is momentum there. So we can hope that in the treaty by uh, the next year Assembly we'll have some mechanism agreed upon to, to facilitate more equitable distribution of resource and capabilities, as well as return of the information and products that can be derived from better understanding and better monitoring infectious disease. And to conclude, I believe that like in our science, country and science paper, uh, there is great room also for learned societies has been alluded by my colleagues to talk to authorities, to talk to uh, practitioners in a one health a new ecosystem uh, to really build together a, a common uh, view, a common perspective that will inspire this network of networks of the future that this technology uh, will allow. So I think we have a bright future if there is more 
effort for working together. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark, for those closing words. Thank you to everyone who's attended today. I hope you've enjoyed the session. Um, of course, thank you to our participants, to Mark, to Guido, to Vitali, Margaret, Stephen, and Josefina for joining us today. Please visit the Frontiers in Science website to read the article and the hub of content that we've uh, we've been discussing today. You can continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag Frontiers Forum. You can subscribe to our newsletter at the Frontiers in Science website. And uh, lastly, please provide your feedback. There will be a questionnaire that pops up uh, after we close down. Please provide your feedback. We do appreciate it. And we do use it to uh, to try and, uh, and, and do even better in the future. But now, from me and all our guests, thank you for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. Goodbye.